Hi there. I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist, and I'm here at my favorite museum, the Utah Museum of Natural History. Utah is famous for its dinosaur discoveries because we find so many fossils in the dry desert terrain. But way back in the Cretaceous time period, millions of years ago, things looked very different around here. Back then, North America was split in two by a shallow sea that went right down the middle. We call the chunk of land that was left in the west, Laramidia. When Utah was part of Laramidia, it looked more like this. A warm, wet, swampy place on the coast of the sea. How do we know? Because paleontologists, scientists like me, find not only dinosaur bones, but many other kinds of fossils. From small fishes and turtles, to giant crocodiles and other water-loving creatures. We even find plant fossils. Laramidia was home to many, many different kinds of dinosaurs. For example, there were duck-billed dinosaurs like Lambiosaurus and Parasaurolophus, and horn dinosaurs like Ineosaurus and Cosmoceratops. No question, Laramidia was an amazing place. Okay, keep watching for more dinosaur discoveries. Hi there. I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist. Do you know what kind of dinosaur this big guy is? It's called Allosaurus, and it was discovered right here in Utah. Allosaurus was a giant carnivore about 30 feet long. It was bipedal, which means that it walked only on its back legs. And Allosaurus is part of a famous group of dinosaurs called theropods. Let's take a look at some of its features. Three-toed feet, large claws on its hands, plenty of sharp teeth for eating meat, and a long tail to help this predator stay balanced. Can you name a few theropods? Giganotosaurus, Ornithomimus, Troodon, and of course, Tyrannosaurus. And don't forget my theropod friend here, Allosaurus. Okay, get outside, get into nature, and make your own discoveries. Hi there, I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist. This cool looking dinosaur is called Cosmoceratops. I know quite a lot about this creature because I was one of the scientists who studied its bones. And I was even lucky enough to name it. Let's take a closer look. This is the mouth down here, which had hundreds of teeth in it. There's a sharp beak up front, a large nose behind, a horn over the nose, the eye socket is here with a big horn over the eye and a smaller horn below it, and then a large bony frill behind with 10 more horns. If you add them all up, that's 15 horns, more than any other dinosaur. Cosmoceratops was found in Utah. The fossils of this animal were so heavy, we had to get help from a helicopter to carry them to the nearest road. Now you may wonder why Cosmoceratops had all these horns. We're not sure, but we think that this giant plant eater used its amazing horns to show off to other Cosmoceratops. Believe it or not, paleontologists like me still find new kinds of dinosaurs all over the world, and there are a lot more out there waiting to be discovered. Maybe one day you'll have the chance to discover a brand new dinosaur. Okay. Keep watching for more dinosaur discoveries. Hi there, I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist. Have you ever wondered what a paleontologist does? Well, we're scientists who study fossils, like this. It all starts with a discovery. Paleontologists hunt for fossils all over the world. Often they're found in rugged, hard to reach places like this one in Utah. If you're lucky enough to find a dinosaur skeleton, the first thing you have to do is get rid of the rock above it. We start off using heavy tools like picks, shovels, or even jackhammers. Then we switch to smaller tools so we don't damage the bones. When the fossils are mostly uncovered, we dig around the sides and then wrap the bones in a protective jacket made of plaster and burlap. Now the bones can be carried safely back to the museum. Field work is just one part of being a paleontologist, but it's a lot of fun finding those fossils. Okay, remember, Get outside, get into nature, and make your own discoveries. Hi there, I'm Dr. Scott the Paleontologist, and this is Sinovenator. Like its cousin, Troodon, Sinovenator may have been nocturnal, 
which means it was most active at night. We humans tend to be most active during the daytime, but it's a lot of fun to go outside at night. Hey, there's Sydney Sinovinator pointing out all the stars. On a clear night like this, you can see hundreds of stars in the sky. Look at them all. Come on, let's count them. Are you ready? One, two, three, up. Forget it. It's hard to believe, but there's actually billions of stars out there in the universe. If you look closely, you can see constellations, groups of stars that form a pattern. It's kind of like playing connect the dots, but at night. Now, if we connect the stars over here, we get a constellation called the Big Dipper. And here's a constellation called the Little Dipper. And that bright star is called the North Star, or Polaris. You can be a stargazer too. Just get outside into your backyard, or better yet, far away from all the city lights, and look up at the hundreds of stars. I'll bet you'll be able to find plenty of cool constellations. Okay, keep watching for more dinosaur discoveries. Hi there, I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist, and it's time for Nature Trackers. The Nature Trackers! Yeah! The ocean is a fantastic place because it's home to all kinds of plants and animals. One of the best places you can explore the ocean is a tide pool. A tide pool is a body of salt water left by the ocean at low tide, when the water level is at its lowest. There are so many types of organisms here, like sea stars, mussels, and barnacles. Scientists use tide pools to learn all kinds of things about all kinds of creatures. It helps them understand more about the environment we live in. You can study tide pools too. Why not plan a scavenger hunt at the beach? and see how many plants and sea creatures you can find. Science and nature are everywhere. So remember, get outside, get into nature, and make your own discoveries. Hi there, I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist, and this is Sanjay, an 11-foot snake that lived with the dinosaurs in the Cretaceous time period. Sanjay is big, but there have been plenty of bigger snakes. Not long after the age of dinosaurs, an African snake named Gigantophus grew over 30 feet long. And then there was Titanoboa that lived in South America. This huge snake grew up to 40 feet long. That's bigger than a school bus. Snakes in the Mesozoic era, like snakes today, don't have arms or legs, so most of the bones in a snake are backbones or vertebrae and lots of ribs. All snakes are reptiles, and all of them are predators, too. Many of these slithering serpents have an amazing ability to catch prey using their whole body. Some snakes, including Sanage and pythons living today, open their mouths really wide, allowing them to swallow animals that are much bigger than their heads. Snakes are some of the most amazing creatures on Earth. Even though they don't have any legs or claws, they're excellent predators that have been around since the age of dinosaurs. Okay, remember, get outside, get into nature, and make your own discoveries. Hi there, I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist. Did you know that the very first flowers appeared near the end of the age of dinosaurs? Yep, that means Jurassic dinosaurs like Stegosaurus and Apatosaurus never saw or smelled a flower. During the Triassic and Jurassic periods, there were plenty of plants around, from tiny ferns to giant conifers, but not a single flower. So plant-eating dinosaurs had to find something else to eat. Flowering plants showed up in the Cretaceous period and soon took over the plant world. There were big flowering trees like magnolias and maples and beautiful little flowering plants. Flowers added a lot more color to the Cretaceous world and a whole new kind of food for plant-eating dinosaurs. So when you see a flower, remember, they've been around for millions of years, since the age of dinosaurs. Okay, get outside, get into nature, and make your own discoveries. Hi there. I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist, and this is the skull of a Tyrannosaurus rex, or T-Rex, just like our friend Buddy. As you can see, an adult T-Rex was huge. The whole body was over 40 feet long, 
making it one of the largest land-living carnivores ever. The T-Rex had some special features on its skull. It had sharp teeth, some of them the size of bananas. It had amazing eyesight, and T-Rex had a great sense of smell. T-Rex also had some special features on its body. Check out those tiny arms. Paleontologists don't even know what they were used for. Recently, scientists working in Asia discovered a relative of T-Rex that lived millions of years before it. It was named Raptor Rex, and it shares many features with its theropod cousin. Check it out. Raptor Rex has a big head, lots of sharp teeth, and tiny arms, just like T-Rex. But there's one big difference between these two carnivores. Their size. Raptor Rex was really small compared to the gigantic T-Rex. Look at the difference. OK, keep watching for more dinosaur discoveries. Hello. Hi there. I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist. One of the greatest things about being out in nature is making new discoveries. It's relaxing going to the beach, but it can also be very exciting. Out here, you can use all five senses, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and seeing. In the city, you'll hear sounds like these. But in nature, if you close your eyes and just listen, you can hear amazing sounds, even the sound of your feet on the sand. Here at the beach, you can actually smell and taste the salty ocean air and water. How about touch? What does a shell feel like, or seaweed? How cold is that ocean water? Of course, there's plenty of things to see here as well, from the tiniest grain of sand to the huge ocean. Up in the sky, you'll see birds and fluffy clouds. OK, remember, get outside, get into nature, and make your own discoveries. Hi there, I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist, and I'm here at the Big Pond. <coughs> Did you hear that? Oh, hey, it's Patricia Paleopatrachus. <coughs> She's a frog from the Cretaceous time period. Patricia and her friend, Albert Albanerpaton, are amphibians, a group of animals that includes frogs, salamanders, and newts. Most amphibians live on land and in the water. They're amazing creatures that go through big changes as they grow up. Frogs, for example, start their lives in the water hatching from eggs as fish-like creatures called tadpole. As they get bigger, tadpoles grow front and back legs and slowly lose their tails. Eventually, they're able to crawl out onto the land where they learn to hop. Oh, and amphibians are great survivors. They've been swimming, crawling, and hopping for millions and millions of years, since long before there were any dinosaurs. We're both amphibians. We're comfortable in the water and on the land. But we like to stay near the pond to keep our skin moist. Well, that's true. But many amphibians did live with the dinosaurs, and lots of different kinds of amphibians live with us humans today. So the next time you're near a pond or lake, listen up for frogs, or see if you can spot a tadpole swimming in the water. OK, keep watching for more dinosaur discoveries. Hi there, I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist. Have you ever helped to plant a garden? It's a great way to learn about nature and a lot of fun. There's lots of different kinds of gardens, flower gardens, rock gardens, and my personal favorite, vegetable gardens. To grow a garden of vegetables, you need to plant seeds, water them, and let the sun give the plants energy to grow. Even if you live in a big city, you can plant a community garden where everyone pitches in. You can help plant, water, and pick what you grow. Eventually, you get to enjoy the best part of growing vegetables, eating them. Wow, carrots, strawberries, peas. What a great garden. Point of fact, dinosaurs did not grow gardens. Thank you. That's true, but you kids can grow your own gardens. OK, remember, get outside, get into nature, and make your own discoveries. Hi there, I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist, and this is the skull of a dinosaur that we discovered right here in Utah. I named it Utah Ceratops. Utah Ceratops was a horned dinosaur, or Ceratopsians, and this was a huge animal, about 20 feet long. But most impressive of all is its enormous head, almost seven feet long. 
Utah Ceratops had a large horn over the nose and short eye horns that stuck out to the side. Similar sideways pointing horns can be seen today in bison. Utah Ceratops horns are different from the horns of all other Ceratopsians. Triceratops had one horn over the nose and much bigger horns over the eyes that pointed forward instead of to the side. Coela Ceratops also had a horn over the nose and even bigger horns over the eyes. And Cosmoceratops, well, it had a total of 15 horns all over its head. This is the skull of a small Ceratopsian named Protoceratops. You can see that it's tiny compared to the skull of Utah Ceratops, but all these plant eaters have a lot in common, including a narrow turtle-like beak up front and a big bony frill in the back. And they all walked on four legs. Okay, keep watching for more dinosaur discoveries. Hi there, I'm Dr. Scott the Paleontologist. And do you know what I'm holding? These are pieces of actual dinosaur eggshell from a real dinosaur egg. Did you know that all dinosaurs hatch from eggs? It's true. Even huge dinosaurs like Brachiosaurus came from an egg not much bigger than this one. We don't know what kind of dinosaur these eggshells came from, but one thing we do know is that these fossils are about 75 million years old. Like birds, dinosaurs laid their eggs in circular nests, usually with about 20 to 25 eggs in each nest. Also like birds, dinosaurs often nested in groups or colonies. Nesting in colonies allowed the adults to protect their eggs and babies from predators, which was very important to those baby dinosaurs. Okay, get outside, get into nature, and make your own discoveries. Hi there, I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist. The animal that flew into the dinosaur train is J. Halornis, a bird that lived during the Cretaceous time period. Incoming! <sighs> Thanks for letting me come in. Paleontologists have learned a lot about J. Halornis because they found many ancient skeletons of this animal in China. You can see that it had wings and a super long feathered tail, even longer than its body. One J. Holornis fossil had seeds and bits of plants in its stomach, suggesting that this ancient bird was an omnivore. It ate both plants and bugs. Another chef special, split seed soup. Mm, it looks as good as the seed witch and the seed souffle. With its long tail, J. Holornis looks a lot like an omnivorous bird living today, the Roadrunner. And how about my tail? Woo! Yeah! Yeah! Nice tail! In recent years, paleontologists working in China have found lots of different kinds of feathered dinosaurs. And we're certain that many more amazing discoveries are still waiting out there. Okay, remember, get outside, get into nature, and make your own discoveries. Hi there, I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist. I'm here in the forest standing beside a huge redwood tree. Redwoods are the tallest trees in the world. Most grow at least 200 feet tall, and some grow as high as 400 feet. Giant redwoods like these live a long time, sometimes more than a thousand years. Trees that have lived so long have definitely survived a few forest fires. Take a look at this redwood. It's been hollowed out by fire, but it's still going strong. The redwood tree's thick bark has a special chemical in it called tannin. Tannin helps protect against fires and harmful insects. It also gives redwoods their red color. So the next time you see a huge redwood tree like this, just think, trees like these were around during the age of dinosaurs. Okay, remember, get outside, get into nature, and make your own discoveries. Hi there, I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist. Do you know something that every living creature on Earth needs? Water. From dinosaurs that lived millions of years ago to us humans living today, we all need water. Most of the water used by land animals and plants comes from rain. Some years, it rains a lot. And other years, well, it hardly rains at all. When it doesn't rain much for a long time, months, 
or even years, we say that a place is having a drought. During a drought, lakes and rivers start to disappear, the ground dries up, and the trees and other plants start to die. Animals and plants that live in deserts, like camels and cactus, have the ability to store water in their bodies, and they can go a long time without any rain. But most plants and animals that don't live in deserts really struggle when there isn't enough water around. During a drought, some animals stay put and try to make the best of it. Eventually, the rain returns and the animals and plants come back too. So, we know that dinosaurs had to deal with droughts just like living animals do today. Okay, keep watching for more dinosaur discoveries. Hi there, I'm Dr. Scott, the paleontologist. Animals spend a lot of time looking for food. Meat-eating animals, or carnivores, use different strategies to catch their food. Let's compare some fish-eating creatures from the Mesozoic era with a few animals living today. Pteranodons probably flew above the water until they spotted a fish and then dove down to grab it using their long beaks. Now, here's a modern bird called the brown pelican. It also flies, dives, and grabs its prey with a long beak. Do you remember how Megaraptor caught fish? Now check out these bears. They sit on the edge of a waterfall and grab fish right out of the water or even out of midair. Wow. Animals living in the age of dinosaurs probably caught fish using the same methods that animals use today. Okay, remember, Get outside, get into nature, and make your own discovery. Once upon a time, there was a mom. Her name was Mrs. Pteranodon. Sitting on her nest, she heard a scratching and said, Oh boy, my eggs are hatching. One by one, her kids popped.